This is Umar Ahmed for IFL TV, proudly sponsored by Everlast. Thank you very much to, to Mr. Top Rank himself, Bob Aram, uh, for joining us just after Christmas. Uh, how was your Christmas, Bob? How did you spend it? We were up in Aspen uh, with a lot of snow, but it was beautiful. And But uh, the air is very, very thin up there because it's uh, 8,000 or more feet above sea level. So it's, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's tough breathing, but uh, it's beautiful, beautiful place. It's good to hear. So I'm sure you uh, managed to keep your mind off boxing for a few days. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, uh, let's uh, discuss top ranks here. How, how would you sum it up uh, 2020 on for top rank, Bob? I think it was a good year, very successful year. We were able to produce terrific uh, fights for both ESPN and Sky. Uh, and uh, I think we got a good handle going forward uh, with some of our stars and the great young talent that we have uh, in top rank. Uh, so uh, I would give it a really good B plus type of year. And uh, I think uh, the next year, uh, God willing, will be better. You mentioned the... Uh the move with Sky Sports, obviously a massive change for us where Matram left Sky Sports and, and Boxer and yourselves in, in top rank jumped on board with Sky. How important was that for you guys at top rank to, to get that deal done with Sky Sports? Because I know you value the UK market a lot, Bob. Yeah, well, well other than the United States, uh, which includes uh, Canada uh, within our footprint, uh, the next important market as far as boxing is concerned is the uk and now that we're established uh providing uh content uh for sky uh that helps uh give a complete roundness uh to our program we've already you know done extraordinarily well in japan uh and uh but the uk market has eluded us until we were able to make the deal with Sky. Cool. So in terms of the US, what was the feedback like from ESPN about this year? About what? Like just, just the year that Top Rank had, what was the, the feedback from ESPN? I, 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 as far as ESPN is concerned, they're pretty transactional. So they don't look at it as a whole year. They look at it event by event. And uh, we received compliments uh, from uh, the top executives uh, pretty much throughout the year on the events that we were putting on. So I think uh, ESPN was very, very satisfied uh, with the product that we gave them. Well, let's talk about some of the, the major events that ESPN saw. Fury Wilder Free, many described it as one of the best fights not just in the heavyweight division, but just one of the best fights they've seen recently. How do you reflect on it, Bob? Still get the tingles when I think of it. I mean, it's that fight was like the thing, a movie, a producer uh, on a boxing movie uh, would think of doing. Guys going down, big guys going down, getting up, putting the other guy down. I mean, it was as exciting of heavyweight fight as you could get. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and particularly since our guy won, it made it even better. But uh, that, that certainly was a highlight of the year. Definitely it was. And as we're on the theme of Tyson Fury, um, I spoke to his UK promoter, Frank Warren, a few days ago. Um, I'm sure you'd have seen his comments. As his US promoter, I'll get your thoughts on his comments as well. So. He said due to Dylan White's arbitration case that's going on, uh, where the, there's a hearing in March, I believe, um, Tyson Fury is looking to fight in March, but with no WBC title on the line. Can you make any comment on that, please? Well, it, it's unfortunate in the sense that Dylan White uh, could have that fight. And uh, there's no question but that uh, we would do that fight. But, I mean, they're... Uh, in our view, very greedy with what they're asking. I mean, particularly 
in the age of the pandemic where you don't really know what kind of spectators you can get or like at the last Tyson Fury fight where we did the event and we did a great gate. Well, it would have been even bigger if we had the UK fans there, which they, could, they couldn't go because of the travel ban in the United States. So, I mean, we've offered them a big, good deal, a purse deal, far more than they've ever uh, gotten in any fight. Uh, and that hasn't moved them. So, I mean, we've talked to the head of the uh, WBC, Mauricio Suleiman, and he said, look, it breaks my heart, but go find another opponent, uh, fight without the WBC title, and we're not gonna take it away from you, uh, and uh, go about your business. Uh, Dylan White really, and his people should come to the table and make the deal to fight Tyson Fury, period, end of story. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not likely to happen. So they're going to play out the arbitration. Uh, and uh, Frank and I, Frank Warren and I are looking for another opponent to do uh, Fury's fight uh, in Manchester uh, or uh, in Las Vegas, depending on who the opponent is. So we're looking at uh, Andy Ruiz as a possibility. He's available. This big uh, Finnish kid who uh, looked very good in the semi windup uh, on the fight uh, on the, the Fury Wild of, uh, uh, card. Um, uh, Hellenius, big, big uh, Finnish uh, kid who, who can really fight. Uh, and those are the two principal guys. I guess if it's Hellenius, we do it in. Uh, in the UK, and if it was uh, uh, Ruiz, we do the fight in Las Vegas because uh, uh, Fury has endeared himself so much to the American fan base uh, that wherever I went uh, uh, this uh, uh, Christmas, uh, I was up in uh, Aspen, and everybody was talking about Tyson Fury and what a character he is. And so uh, he's become a big draw card in the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd love to uh, do his next fight in the United States. Uh, Frank uh, uh, wants to do a fight for him uh, in the UK. And, you know, I'm, I'm all in with that. Uh, and Tyson, I think, prefers to do his next fight in uh, Manchester. Uh, but I really think that uh, we're going to have to take a look at the whole situation. Uh, uh, with the, the, the pandemic is the big, uh, yes. is the big uh, actor here. And, mm -hmm. and if... Um, uh, if... Um, uh, it continues. I know you've shut down uh, yes. uh, all sports in the month of January, and that could continue to, to February and March. Okay. Uh, and uh, if uh, that looks like it's going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we're not going to shut down okay. in the United States, particularly not in Nevada, which has a big tourist economy. And we're just pressing everybody to get vaccinated. Oh, yes. So if they catch COVID, yes. it's like catching a cold yes. if you are vaccinated. Right. So let's, you know, I'll be talking to That's Frank right. uh, later this and, week uh, and Tyson, well, and we'll figure out what we're going to be doing. Them, I have them on. Um, Sorry, Bob, you're just picking up in the background there. I think someone. Yeah, please. Lovey, yes. lovey. <laughs> on a Zoom call. Yes. Okay, uh, Bob, just, just want to pick up so, some things you there said. So the picture I'm getting, it's either Hellenius in Manchester or Ruiz in Vegas are the main options at the moment, correct? That is correct. Okay. And in terms of Dylan White and his situation, obviously himself and Eddie Earn are asking for a, 
a 45% split. How do you think the arbitrator is going to see this, Bob? I, you know, I, again, I don't, I, I, you know, I believe that from what I know about the case, uh, that he doesn't have much of a case. And what he should do is now come to the table and work out a deal for the fight to happen. Uh, you know, I'd like that fight to happen, happen in the UK. Frank has a place in Cardiff that we can put it on. Uh, and, uh, you know, if he thinks he can win, which I assume he doesn't, but if he thinks he can win, let him win and become the WBC champion and stop crapping around uh, with the arbitration and uh, looking to push for the biggest dollar. Uh, you know, uh, Tyson is the big attraction. Nobody has heard in the United States of Dylan White, really. Uh, and uh, I think we've offered him a deal uh, of... Uh, 25% uh, with a guarantee uh, and uh, let him negotiate for all that. But again, he says he wants uh, uh, eight figures, you know, over 10 million, which is like out of the question. I don't know what he's talking about. Okay. Is it hard to, to negotiate at the moment, obviously, though, because the WBC haven't determined the split? So is that a problem at the moment? No, the WBC. It, you know, we'd be talking about a 20 or 25 percent for the challenge and 75, 80 or 75 percent for the uh, uh, for the uh, for the champion. But let him come to the table with a with an, a, a normal, you know, type of negotiation, not say that he wants uh, eight figures. And who would that deal be done with? Because we know Dylan White's a free agent. So are you asking Dylan's people to come directly to you? Yeah, Tyson. I mean, uh, Todd has been talking uh, to a guy named Jay. Yeah. Uh, and some representative in the United States. And I would look for them, you know, quit the crap and just let's sit down and have a Zoom call and see if we can put it together because nobody wants litigation, you know? It, you know, just as soon fight Dylan White as Salinas or Andy Ruiz and get it done. And if White thinks he can beat uh, Fury, then, uh, he, you know, nobody's asking him for any options or continuation. Then he's a free agent and the world champion and then he can do a unification with the winner of uh, Usyk and Joshua. I mean, you know, but uh, but I I'm afraid they're looking at this as their last hurrah, and they want to grab as much money as they can. Well, that makes it a tough negotiation. And for that offer that you did send them, I believe you said it was a 25% split. Did you hear anything back from them? Yeah, they won $10 million. We won, uh, we won a, a, you know, to guarantee them $5 million or $5.5 million against the percentage. And they won. They, they said you got to start at eight, at eight uh, numbers you got to start at 10 million you know and that probably is not enough for them so they're just being greedy and i mean that's one thing that's really bad about boxing look at your purses that you've made throughout your your career mm. i mean this would be by far his biggest purse we're prepared to pay it uh, and yet you know they're they're just grinding it out so we'll just have to fight Tyson will just have to fight uh, for the Ring Magazine title. He'll save his sanction fee money. Uh, hopefully, he'll be successful. Uh, and then uh, uh, Usyk and Joshua will, will have fought. And the winner will be out there. And he'll go on to fight them, with or without the WBC title. So 
you know, the loser is going to be, uh, without any question, uh, Dylan White. Okay, just my last point on that, um, from what you've just said. So, at the moment, the situation seems obviously Fury's going to fight without the WBC, either in Vegas or uh, in Manchester against Ruiz or Hellenius. Are you then saying that you will skip the WBC mandatory with White and fight the winner of Usyk Joshua? Is that what you're saying? Sure. I mean, that would, again, it's up to Tyson Fury. He's the guy doing the fighting. But yeah, of course, that's what he'll do. I mean, you know, again, we love the WBC. We love Mauricio Suleiman, a great guy. But business is business. And if it goes this length, you know, and even if they're successful in, uh, in this uh, uh, arbitration, uh, what are they going to end up with? Fighting some non-entity on a title nobody's going to care about. He's still Dylan White, you know? Dylan White's not a big attraction. Tyson Fury is a huge attraction, just the way Joshua has been a huge attraction. Okay, enough heavyweight talk. So uh, another event that I want to talk to you about that was a, a big one for top rank was, of course, Terence Crawford and Sean Porter. Um, obviously, there was a bit of a, a situation after where Terence said that um, he won't be renewing with top rank. How is that relationship left now, Bob, with you and Terence? Oh, he's, he's right. I mean, we've had a contract with him. He's lived up to his contract. We've lived up to our contract with him. Uh, we got him the Porter fight, which is a big victory. And now he's a free agent and he's going to look around for the best possible opportunity. Now, why should that be different in boxing than it is in any other sport? Mm. In, you know, a baseball player, a football player, when he's out of his contract, is a free agent and he looks to make the best deal possible. And everybody says, fine, that's natural. Well, as far as Terrence Crawford is concerned, it's natural. If we'll come up with the best deal, He's used to dealing with us. I'm sure it'll be acceptable to him. Mm -hmm. If, for example, we have him fight Josh Taylor, comes up, Josh Taylor comes up, and we make it uh, uh, advantageous economically uh, for uh, for uh, Crawford and Taylor, he'll go with that. Now, if somebody comes up with a Spence fight and they're offering him a lot of money, he'll go with that. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, people get sort of crazy. I mean, because in this era, it's long-term contracts and then, well, he's left you and so forth. No, he's, he's finished his contract. He's done his contract. He's, he's, he's earned what he was supposed to earn. Hmm. And now he has to look for the best possible uh, deal uh, that's out there. I mean, that's the way it used to be. Hmm. You know, going back to the 80s and 90s, uh, particularly the 80s, where I would had all these great Leonard and Hearns and Hagler, nobody had long-term contracts. Hmm. And yet I did, of the nine fights that they had, seven of the nine, but without tying anybody to a particular contract, other than the fight contract. Hmm. We know Canelo's doing this at the moment, where he's a free agent and he's dictating to various promoters, but I feel like his situation's a bit different. You know, his fights, you know, are guaranteed to at least generate 600, 700,000 buys, if not more. So with someone like Terence Crawford, do you think he can dictate to promoters in the same fashion? No, it, 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 it's a little different from Terence. Terence is a great, great talent, but he's not a great draw. Although he did sell, we did sell out uh, the Mandalay Bay when he fought Porter. Uh, but, you know, uh, Canelo has this tremendous Hispanic fan base, which is huge in the United States. 
and he's able to uh, draw uh, quite well. Mm -hmm. And what he is doing is not looking around shopping for another promoter, but if somebody comes to him with the opponent that he wants to fight, then he'll do it with that, the, the promoter's opponent with certain uh, restrictions. So, you know, he, he did a fight with uh, two fights with Eddie Hearn, then one fight with the PBC. And if he wants to fight um, uh, or if uh, Joe Smith beats uh, uh, your kid, uh, Johnson, uh, yeah, then he'll come to us. We have great relationship with him and we'll make a deal with him. Hmm. And, you know, that's perfectly acceptable. You know, he's, he, I, I mean, I love Canelo. He's such a, he's a really good guy. Eddie Reynoso is a terrific trainer and, and they're my friends, but I understand what the business is and there's no reason for them to hook up with any promoter. Let's talk about the light heavyweight division then. We've seen Arthur Betabiev recently with a fantastic win over Marcus Brown. Um, have there been conversations with Eddie Reynoso about potentially making that fight between Betabiev and Canelo? There haven't been any real conversations. We kibitz around about it, but no, again, no conversation. I think they might want to fight uh, Joe Smith. Okay. Ex and then go to Better Be Off to unify the ties, I think. And they, they've sort of hinted at that. That's why this fight January 15th with Better Be Off and Callum Johnson is so important. Do you think we could see a potential better BF Bivol fight as well? We spoke to Bivol's guys about that. Yeah, I mean, but, but really that fight has really no pizzazz to it. Bivol is a, is a very good boxer, sort of boring fighter. And, you know, again, people in the light will look at the light heavyweight division want to see shootouts, mm -hmm. like Better Bio's last fight with Brown, uh, like uh, uh, this upcoming Smith fight with Callum Johnson. You know, Bivol is an excellent boxer, but, uh, but he's sort of boring uh, to watch. Well, you're right. Your, your first event uh, of 2022 is a shootout between Joe Smith Jr. and Callum Johnson. Um, Frank Warren's mentioned the possibility also of uh, Anthony Yard fighting the winner. Obviously, if, if for yourself, if Joe Smith Jr. wins, are you, you open to that? He's WBO number one now, Anthony Yard. Yeah, absolutely. Yard is a good fighter. He put up a great fight with um, uh, Kovalov yeah. uh, a while ago. Uh, he's won the fight in you know, good fashion uh, with this... Uh, What's his name? Lyndon. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you, obviously from the standpoint of, uh, of, uh, of Joe Smith, uh, he wants uh, the biggest fights out there. So he, number one, obviously the Holy Grail is to fight Canelo. Uh, number two is probably from the fight a unified fight with the better be off. And then third would be to fight Yard. Mm. And it may be a better be off uh, Smith fight may be too expensive given the demands of the fighters. And so uh, Joe Smith, if he beats Callum Johnson, might very well, you know, want to fight uh, Yardy, which would be a good fight. Definitely would. Let's talk about one of your favourites in Josh Taylor. So we know he's got his uh, upcoming defence of his undisputed titles in the UK. Now, we've got a, a tricky situation in the UK. As you said, in January, there'll be no uh, fights on in January in the UK. The British Border Control have ruled that. His fight with Jack Cattrall's uh, in February. And that fight is very dependent on, on having a crowd. Obviously, he brings in ma massive uh, numbers with the Scottish fans, etc. So uh, are we looking at a potential... 
um, extension of this date, Bob, considering what's going on with COVID in the UK? We don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, as a last resort, I would probably ask both of the guys to come to the States since the travel ban is no longer there uh, and do the fight in Las Vegas. But obviously the fight belongs where uh, it is in Glasgow. And I think it's we've sold out the arena. Yeah. So, you know, but again, you know, uh, these uh, people who run things uh, in these various places have different views as far as the COVID is concerned. My view as uh, uneducated as it might be is that if we all get inoculated and we have the vaccine, the booster, yeah, we'll get COVID. But, you know, so what? We're going to have to live with COVID for the next hundred years, just the way we've been living with the flu since the Spanish flu in 1918. You know, I mean, again, we're not going to be able to eradicate the flu completely, no matter how many vaccinations we have. But people who have been, I mean, look what happened at the Boxing Writers Dinner in New York on December uh, uh, 9th. Uh, some guy unvaccinated came in, uh, a writer, and uh, he had COVID and he transmitted COVID to 50 or so of the people attending, which was 20% of the people there. Now, of all the people that he uh, caught, uh, caught the COVID, all of them had been vaccinated, thank God. And while they got the COVID and got sick for a day or two, that was it. So we can't panic with this COVID anymore. We're going to have to live with it for the next hundred years. Anyways, Bob, so um, I'm sure these, these Scottish fans who are uh, planning to attend Taylor Cattrall in Scotland wouldn't mind the trip to Vegas. So, yeah, that's a plan B. Yeah, we'd love to have them. It's great for business. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I sure mean, the casinos won't mind. I mean, oh, yeah. What about the beer companies? <laughs> I never saw people communicate beer uh the way Scots and uh, Irish do. <laughs> okay, Bob, just a couple of more things to, to run through. So uh, a disappointing night for Tiafimo Lopez. I know it wasn't on your show. Uh, it was on Matram's show uh, against George Cambosis Jr. So what are the immediate plans for Tia? I just spoke to Tia. He's still in New York. He hasn't gotten permission to travel because he apparently which is again, something that fighters have to avoid. He, 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 he didn't go about going to getting down and weight the way he should have. He got dehydrated. He had problems with his lungs and the esophagus uh, and he almost died. Uh, so I've told him, uh, make sure you're okay. He thinks by the end of this week, before the new year, they'll give him permission to go back to Vegas. I'll meet with him and his father and no more 135 pounds and fight at 140. Okay, okay. Well, it would be an interesting move for him to, to go to 140. He has to. He, I mean, he, you, I, I hate, I, the one thing I hate about the sport of boxing is, is making weight mm -hmm. and people artificially, because they think it gives them an advantage and it probably does, fighting in a, in a division which they really shouldn't be at. They should be in a, in a higher division, but everybody gets themselves down to, to fight in the lower division because they then have a size advantage over their opponent. Okay, well, Bob Lomachenko Komi was a, another great event for, for top rank. A fantastic uh, display from 
Vasil Lomachenko and Richard Comey, who showed great art in there. Um, right. Now, you've mentioned the possibility of Lomachenko fighting Cambosis Jr. as a WBO mandatory. Where are we with that, with the WBO? Again, again, we have to get, get the COVID, <laughs> you know, uh, right now there's no lockdown in Australia. That fight would be huge in Australia. And if we did it on a Sunday afternoon, it would be prime time Saturday night in the United States. A lot of money there on the fight. But if we can't come in, go into Australia, uh, because of the COVID, it's a non-starter pretty much. But so we'll have to see. I really think the Cambosa people have uh, the best intentions to fight Lomachenko and Lomachenko would like to fight Cambosa and would love to fight him in Australia. Uh, so we'll see. You know, there nobody is being recalcitrant it's just a question of uh, what is the effect of the COVID regulations. Okay, okay. And uh, a final one to finish off, I'm going to bring it back to the heavyweight division. I think it's only right. Um, your rising prospect, uh, one of the best prospects in world boxing, obviously with, you, with yourself, uh, it's Jared Anderson, uh, causing a lot of noise in the heavyweight division. A big 2022 for him, Bob? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's the goods. And he's such a nice young man, a lot of fun. I mean, he's what you want in a prospect. Uh, there's not a mean bone in his body until the bell ring to start the fight. Uh, and then when the fight's over, he's just the happy-go-lucky guy. Uh, I mean, what a great personality, great smile. I mean, he is, he's the goods. And so hopefully uh, he'll be a real contender uh, by the end of uh, next year. And Tyson Fury has already designated him as the next heavyweight champion. Yeah, he has. And uh, Jared's mentioned the likes of Philip Hergovich and Daniel Dubois already. Yeah, um, absolutely. Those are great fights. Yeah, definitely would be. Well, listen, Bob Arum, congratulations on a, another brilliant year for Top Rank. Appreciate all the time you've given IFL TV this year, and I'm sure we're going to catch up soon, a lot next year as well. Thank you. Thank you, and Bob. This is a big year for me. You turn 90, you know, that's a big number. And uh, <laughs> But I want to wish you a very happy new year, and we'll talk on the other side. Likewise, Bob. Uh, yeah, you got a nice little sing-song uh, from someone special for your 90th birthday, didn't you? Yeah, wasn't that nice? Yeah, that was incredible. <laughs> Bob Aaron, thank you very much and Happy New Year to you as well. Thank you. Thank you too.